Dr. Herbert Benson, as the uh, founder of the Harvard Mind Body Center, uh, you've obviously devoted much of your life to studying and understanding the relationship between the mind and the body. Yet when the lay, average layperson hears things like mind over matter, mm -hmm. I mean, they usually probably just associate it with a saying, or maybe it's something that has an effect on people who really aren't that sick. I mean, you in turn have found something very different in terms of the power of the relationship between mind and body. Oh, there's no question but that the mind profoundly affects the body. For example, my initial work going back 25 years with a relaxation response. Right. Here, the simple act of thinking a certain way, sitting, for example, focusing your breathing, and on each out breath, repeating a word, a sound, a prayer, a phrase, or even a muscular activity, and then passively disregarding the everyday facts when they come to mind, everyday thoughts when they come mm -hmm. to mind, with a return to the repetition. That leads to a set of remarkable bodily changes. Decreased metabolism, decreased heart rate, decreased rate of breathing, uh, decreased blood pressure, slower brain waves, all of which are a mind-body effect. Well, let's talk about the relaxation response. See, this is a pioneering work, which I guess you, you were really almost the first who, who underscored the relationship of stress. To, to illness, that stress either causes or makes virtually all illnesses worse. Actually, it was Dr. Hans Selye well, you can take in, Mon for in Montreal, no, 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 <laughs> who pointed out that relationship. What we were able to say is that the body possesses a response opposite to the stress response, which is the relaxation mm -hmm. response, and we can use mind body, this mind body reaction to counteract the numerous diseases which are caused by stress. Now, what, what, give us, give us a little bit better understanding of what the relax, relaxation response is. I mean, it's more than something you would get the, the salutary effect of rest, for example, oh, sure. or sleeping. The best way to understand the relaxation response is to look at its counterpart, the stress response, mm -hmm. also called the fight or flight response. When we undergo any change, when there's need for behavioral adjustment, change, are, there's an internal secretion of adrenaline and noradrenaline, mm -hmm. which leads to anxiety, leads to mild and moderate depression, leads to anger and hostility, influences high blood pressure, cardiac irregularities, all forms of pain, infertility, sleep, PMS, hot flashes, sexual performance. They are all affected by these hormones and the fight or flight response. The relaxation response is the physiologic opposite to the fight or flight response. And it's characterized by the decreased metabolism, blood pressure, heart rate, slower brain waves that counteract the harmful effects of stress. Mm -hmm. So if I was a caveman, for example, and I saw a saber-toothed tiger, the flight or fight response would be important to me, though all those conditions, because they would they would tell me what to do, but in the absence of saber-toothed tigers... Ah, it still has its effect on your body, and mm -hmm. it's socially inappropriate to lash out at a person who is right. giving you a hard time or, for example, to start running around the table. So these hormones take their effects on our body. And how do I induce the relaxation response? There are two basic steps necessary to evoke the relaxation response. The first is a repetition. Mm -hmm. It can be traditionally a prayer but it could be a word, a sound, a phrase, or even a repetitive muscular activity. Secondarily, everyday thoughts come to mind. They should be expected, but when they come, you simply say, oh well, and passively return to the repetition. In other words, to passively ignore the everyday thoughts when they occur, and then return to the repetition. This is, again, no more complicated than chanting? chanting, a mantra, meditation, the Lama's breathing techniques, yoga, uh, progressive muscular relaxation, uh, autogenic training, all of these evoke the relaxation response. Now, I understand that of all the various techniques that would evoke the relaxation response, that the most potent of which in, in your research happened to be prayer or something that invoked religious or spiritual meaning for the, the chanter. Yes, but what's important is that it's not that it's religion per se, but it's what the person believes in. Mm -hmm. And it's just that so many people have a profound belief in something beyond us. 
that for them, prayer is a very good way to evoke the relaxation response. Which led you to timeless healing, the whole yes. notion between faith and healing. Now give us some examples there of, of where there is evidence that those with faith or those who use their faith can overcome bodily disabilities. Let's go back to where the medical literature has classified faith and belief, and it's with, within what's called the placebo effect. Sure. The belief and expectancy on the part of a patient, the belief and expectancy on the part of the physician, and the beliefs that come from their relationship can evoke extremely powerful um, uh, happenstances. Let me give you, for example, belief on the part of the patient. Women suffering from nausea and vomiting of pregnancy partook in an experiment where they swallowed small intragastric balloons, which were in no way bothersome, but through which uh, the investigators were able to measure the contractions of the stomach, which were everyday nausea and vomiting mm -hmm. type of work. They were then given a drug that they were told would cure their nausea and vomiting. In truth, they were given Ipecac which is used to induce vomiting. A child overdoses, you give them Ipecac, the child vomits. The patients believed the Ipecac would reverse their nausea and vomiting. Not only did the nausea and vomiting disappear, but their stomach contractions returned to normal. Here, the belief and expectancy was able to actually reverse the pharmacologic action of a drug. I understand there is something also called a nocebo effect, yes. that if I believe something <clears throat> bad, is going to happen to me. The likelihood of that manifesting itself sure. physically is also also. Uh, Beliefs can kill you. If you believe in voodoo, voodoo and you death. have a hex, yeah. it's not the, the hex that's killing you, it's your belief in it. And in fact, there are areas in the brain which when stimulated induce serious life-threatening um, arrhythmias. Insula cortex is the area, so fear is connected f through the, the brain cells to that area so fear can evoke this arrhythmia and people can die. Now you're a cardiologist, a professor of medicine at Harvard University. I mean hardly the, the image or the credentials of what we normally associate with those who practice alternative medicine. Uh, give, give me a, just a little sense, a flavor of, of how your practice and, and your approach to cardiology, for example, might have been changed as a consequence of your findings of the relationship of mind, body, and faith body. The relaxation response has now become part of medicine in the States. Mm -hmm. In other words, what I'm saying is not just the way I practice medicine, but for example, a recent National Institutes of Health Technology Assessment Conference said that the relaxation approaches are, are imperative to use, for example, in chronic pain and insomnia. It's now recommended for hypertension, for cardiac arrhythmias, for gastrointestinal mm -hmm. problems. It is in mainstream medicine. That's, we're already there. What is new now, though, is the power of belief itself, and that's what I cover primarily in right. the new book, namely the power and biology of belief. Now here, that we're not using that because the placebo effect is still a pejorative. It's all in your head. It's a sugar pill. Yeah, you almost. Uh, I tend to think people. You know, when you say, "Well, someone was given a sugar pill and that they yes. got better," that they probably weren't very sick at exactly. all. Exactly. But your your research shows that that the improvement is not in, in the marginal. It's like sixty to ninety percent. Oh yes. Improvement oh. when when placebo experiments are carried. Exactly out. in diseases like angina pectoris, asthma, uh, skin rashes. Uh, um, swelling after uh, uh, teeth are pulled. Um, there are numerous disorders. Let me give you one example of a study done in Japan, which is dramatic, where young high school students who were allergic to sumac, just the way we have poison mm -hmm. ivy here, well, they were blindfolded and they were told they were going to be stroked on one arm with chestnut tree leaves, the other with poison sumac but the experimenters reversed them. Right. The arm stroked with the sumac, nothing happened. The arm stroked with the chestnut leaves, believed to be sumac, had a rash breakout. Here's another example of a physical manifestation of belief. 
Now, you've introduced a concept that I wasn't familiar with at all until I, I looked at your book, the notion of remembered wellness yes. as, a, as a concept that, I guess, encompasses the placebo effect and, and others. Well, explain that to me and what the scientific foundation of remembered wellness is. We have chosen to rename the placebo effect because we're not going to get away with these negative attitudes that you and I are speaking about and are now calling it remembered wellness. Mm -hmm. Let, what that refers to is actual wiring in our brain, are trillions upon trillions upon trillions of connections in our brain. In fact, you said we are psychologically wired to God. Oh, yes, let me get to that okay, in we'll a get bit. To God. Okay, but all our thoughts, all our feelings of well-being, all our pains are part of our wiring. The classic exa uh, example of this is phantom limb syndrome. You have a pain in, in your hand. You have it for years and years. Ultimately, due to accident or surgery, you lose your hand. You will still often have that pain because the area in your brain is still registering remembering. pain, remembering it. Exactly. Now, remembered wellness simply comes about when you take a pill or you have faith in a pill working right. and for your headache. So the pill is simply a sugar pill, let's say, but your belief in that pill clicks into your brain as, it's okay, I'm going to be taken care of, and then your remembered wellness of what it was to be without the pain mm -hmm. comes about and the pain disappears. But what you're talking about is more than just kind of an optimism that I'll get better. I mean, you've shown that people who are deeply religious, who have faith as part of their essence, get well in a shorter period of time or less That's prone right. to debilitating disease? Yes. It, now, is this the psychological wiring, you know, the physiological well, wiring into God? Our intelligence has made us rulers of the earth. We are so far more intelligent than any other species. But it's also brought us a knowledge that no other species has. That is, of our own mortality. We're probably the only species alive that knows it's going to die. That brings with it a fundamental anxiety. And counter to survival, knowing we're going to die is depressing. I mean, why go on? What use if it all ends? And when you go back in history, there isn't one culture of humans from the earliest writings that hasn't written about something beyond death, beyond ourselves, a power, a force, energy, God, if you will, also hasn't written about an afterworld. Gilgamesh, all the way. Mm -hmm. We have this there. And in fact, a wonderful writer in this, Karen Armstrong, has written that as long as we were recognizably human, we have believed in God. Her work is a history of God. And she claims we shouldn't be called Homo sapiens, but we should be called Homo religiosus. It's part of us. See, but, but science, as a discipline, avoids. Religion. I, I've had scientists who sat right there and just said when we've asked them about the intersection of faith and religion and science, they just said, look, we can't deal with that, so therefore we don't. I mean, is, is the scientific community, or maybe more specifically the medical community, made a big mistake by, by assiduously avoiding an understanding I, of the role of faith in, in psychology and in, in physiology? I believe so. And the reason is, is that neurobiology is now showing us these wirings I'm talking about which profoundly affect health. And these old distinctions of mind versus body, East mm -hmm. versus West, medicine and religion are really falling away. Now, I understand also, I was surprised to see that, that this sense of faith and the impact of faith on, on, on healing extends to your attitude towards your physician, and I guess more precisely, the behavior of the physician vis-a-vis -vis the patient. It's very important that a doctor-patient relationship be a sound one, that we not view medicine as only being pharmaceuticals and surgery, but rather relationships of what a person can do for himself or herself becomes exceptionally important. Well, you tell the, the surprising research about the anesthetologist, I believe. Yes, for example, uh, patient, this was a study done at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital where patients were matched with respect to disease and the surgery they were going to have, severity of disease, 
age and sex. So One, we got two good groups. Two that control were, groups. Right. Two, I mean, two comparable groups, a control group and a regular group, and a, an experimental group. The control group was seen by the anesthesiologist in a rather cursory fashion. My name is Dr. So-and-so. Tomorrow I'm going to give you anesthesia. Don't worry, everything's going to be all right. The other group, the experimental group, was seen by the same anesthe anesthesiologist. He or she sat on the patient's bed, held the patient's hand, told them exactly what to expect in the way of pain and suffering, and worked very hard to establish a warm and sympathetic relationship. Mm -hmm. Next day, patients operated upon. Both groups were allowed to have as much pain-killing medication they, as they required. The doctors, nurses, and others caring for the patients didn't know to which group the patients belonged. Those who were treated in the compassionate fashion required half the amount of medication and on the average were discharged from the hospital 2.7 days sooner than the other group. The simple act mm -hmm. of compassion translating into measurably different results. But I mean, I've had the unfortunate experience of having, you know, fairly extensive exposure to doctors over the last little while, and my experience has been almost exactly the opposite. They are the most negative breed I've ever seen in my life. You ask, how long do I have to live? Well, we don't know. You know, what are my chances of recovering? We don't know. I think this will have to change. If we want to optimize our medicine, uh, relationships are critical. But we want to establish a new balance. I liken this to health and well-being being akin to a three-legged stool. One leg is pharmaceuticals, another leg is surgery and procedures, but the third leg is self-care. And in that self-care leg, we have nutrition, we have exercise, we have the relaxation mm -hmm. response, and we have belief. A critical part of belief is the relationship you have with your physician. And the belief in the physician. You must feel comfortable. There's a rush towards alternative medicine, which I believe is essentially remembered wellness. There's nothing that works in homeopathy. It's your belief in homeopathy mm -hmm. that makes it work. But why are patients going there? Because they're being cared for in a compassionate way by practitioners of alternative medicine. Now, speaking of one of those legs on the stool, I mean, I could see how the faith community would welcome your, uh, your research and the work that's mm -hmm. being done at the Mind Body Center. But how, how about like the pharmaceutical sector, for example? I mean, would they see this as a, a terrible threat? Very interestingly, we're working with several pharmaceutical houses who see that they can branch out into behavior and that belief in their pills will take their worthwhile pills and even make them work better. So I see us actually as forming a partnership with them and there are several who are quite interested in doing this. What about the doctors? I mean, here in Ontario, for example, is that because of the way the billing structure works, that they literally are encouraged to have as many cursory visits as possible, the more, the more, more, more remuneration. Uh, it would su suggest to me that a lot of the practices that are going on in the medical profession run absolutely contrary to the kinds of practices that have to be put into effect to take into account of faith on healing. In the States, we had largely prior to the last four or five years, mostly fee-for-service right. type uh, reimbursement, which is akin to what you have here. Even there, mm -hmm. the doctors would tire of patients coming back over and over again that they couldn't help and would readily incorporate our work. In a managed care system where there's capitation, where they're prepaid, right. our work decreases visits. And in that sense, in that kind of system, it's really money in the bank. Mm -hmm. What, uh, I mean, but, but the trends really do seem to be in the, in the opposite direction. Where the, the, because, and mostly mm. because of, I don't think this is any kind of malevolence. It's the, it's the fiscal constraints that's on the healthcare system in North America. Increasing reliance on technology, you know, trying to uh, turn relationships over as, as quickly as possible. What do you have to do to reverse the Patient, trends? Patients will do this. First of all, patients will demand a more caring type of medicine. Secondarily, at least in the States, 95% of people believe in, in God. Mm -hmm. And the people are flocking towards such healers. And now, it may not be God itself that's doing the healing, but belief in God. But it's a win situation. If God exists, wonderful, it's a doubly win. Either way, this kind of belief and belief in the power of belief itself 
often engendered by a doctor, mm -hmm. will have to be paid attention to, and the systems will change because they'll get so expensive that they'll, they, they won't be able to sustain themselves. One of the trends we've seen in society generally is that if you ask people today what's their number one health concern related to work, stress is right at the top of the list. It's no longer, you know, getting a rusty mm -hmm. nail going yeah. through my work boot or a, or a brick falling on my, uh, my safety helmet. I mean, the stress is endemic That's right. in, in our society now. I mean, what does this suggest, your findings, about what we should be doing, not simply in terms of medically to treat the symptoms of stress, but societally? So to reduce some, stress. Stress comes about from any situation that requires behavioral adjustment. In other words, any change is stressful. What we have to do is, and this is often difficult, to try and stabilize things a bit because it's the change that's causing the stress. Short of that, which is exceptionally difficult in, in our society, we have to learn how to protect ourselves. So people should be eliciting the relaxation response by a method they believe in mm -hmm. on a daily basis. That this should become part of our exactly. day to day and life. And in the old world it was. People would pray in the morning, pray in the evening. There would be quiet periods in the day. As our world has become so frenetic, so more frenetic and excitatory and changing, rather than stepping back, we get caught up on it and further the process. Is, is that change and therefore that stress, in your view, oh, responsible for an endemic increase in, in I, diseases? I believe so. I Things believe like cancer? You oh, no, no, really no. Is I, there is no relationship between cancer and stress. That oh, is really? causation. No, but stress does affect the immune system, so right. the course of a cancer after it begins might be... That the immune system some, doesn't have the strength. There are, exactly. But there are many diseases that are related to stress in a major way, hypertension, anxiety, insomnia, infertility. Mm -hmm. And the proof of this is, first of all, the, the hormonal changes. Secondarily, the results we're getting. We can cure 75% of insomniacs now. 36% of our infertile couples become pregnant within six months after going through our program. Through the relaxation response? Relaxation well. response, plus a lot of cognitive work, you mm -hmm. know, stress management. Uh, we can treat the symptoms of cancer and AIDS. Frequently, in the early stages of cancer, it's not the cancer causing the symptom, but your worry about being a cancer. The very oh. words, you have cancer, changes you. I mean, and frequently symptoms will come from that. Or you're HIV positive, you may feel fine. And then as soon no, as you're diagnosed. diagnosed symptoms, be, we know how to treat them. Well, you, you were even saying that, that when I get a doctor's appointment, I normally feel better. Exactly. Just knowing that I'm going. Or you're sitting there and suddenly in the doctor's office and suddenly yeah. the symptoms disappear. Now, you would be the last to discount the tremendous advances that traditional medicine That's has right. made in, in, in all fields, the pharmacological in terms of surgical. How do we find that balance? That we, how do we get practitioners who, whose esteem and, and, you know, status flows from I'm a brilliant surgeon or I'm a, a brilliant radiologist to understand the, the, the non-technical, the non-procedural side of medicine? Our, my experience at Harvard Medical School and with the doctors I work with in Boston has been a ready acceptance of this because we all recognize our limitations and would welcome how patients could help themselves. There isn't a surgeon who isn't worried when a patient says, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And in fact, many will not operate on such people. So uh, they're, they, we're preparing people for surgery now. Our, our next generation of, of medical practitioners, you even think, will the bring this oh, yeah, because as part the, of their baggage? The science is there. And even the practicing physicians now, once they see the data, are using these approaches.